For us, it's a way of using design to not solve problems or um, aim for things to be put into production, but to raise issues and ask questions and to challenge assumptions. I think that uh, when we were discussing critical design a few years ago, we thought it was the opposite of affirmative design. We thought affirmative design is design that reinforces how things are, the status quo, if you like, and critical design is a way of offering up alternatives, suggesting that there might be different ways. I think the idea of design as a form of critique has existed for a long time. Um, and critical design was just a term that we used in relation to our own work to help us position it. I think um, things like the radical design of the 60s and 70s in Italy was a, a big inspiration to us, people like Andrea Branzi and uh, Sotsas' early work and the kinds of projects they were doing. And, um, and in architecture too, yeah. you know, Super Studio, we were really influenced by Archigram, all those um, thinking of different kinds of ways in which you might live. Um, mm. I think we're very influenced by those movements. I think for us that was probably our starting point. Mm. You know, when we, you know, obviously you, when you're studying, you look at the whole range of historical precedents. But for us, we got excited at what was happening at that period in design history and those ideas of critiquing the existing social and economic structures and so on. And that was our starting point. I think the project Hertz and Tails was probably the first one, wasn't it, that we started exploring that. Mm. And there specifically, we were interested in how, you know, the world was filling up with electronic products um, that were providing very limited experiences. They were allowing us to, you know, talk to each other via the telephone and so on, or process information. But the range of emotional possibilities were extremely narrow. And we, the Hertz and Tails project was meant to sort of draw attention to that narrowness through a variety of design proposals like the Faraday chair and the Thief of Affection and so on and offer up alternatives to how electronic products could give us much richer and more challenging experiences. And again, it wasn't a kind of a, an anti-statement or an aggressive attack. It's much more just kind of, you know, hey, things could be like this, things could be much more interesting, much more challenging, and hoping that our examples sitting alongside the more normal ones would, um, you know, open up this discussion. I think the Weeds, Aliens and Other Stories project is a good example too, because with Hearts and Tales we found Although it was done about 10 years ago, we found it was quite abstract and people found it hard to understand exactly often what the critique was about because electronic technology was still quite um, something quite special. And the Weeds project, we really were taking furniture quite consciously to say, well, you know, if we, if we design according to a different set of values, it becomes clear that um, there are other possibilities. So, you know, why continue to design tables and chairs and shelves and bookcases um, at the end of the 20th century. And so that project was about trying to design a world of furniture, into the world of furniture, that responded to much more personal obsessions and poetic needs. And by doing that, hope that kind of gently critiqued the narrowness of, of mainstream furniture design that in our eyes was obsessed with style and materials and production and things like that. So for us, critical design is just a useful way of helping to position our work. It's design, as people understand that. Its purpose is some kind of critique, and therefore people aren't going to keep asking us, you know, how are you going to put it into production? Who needs this stuff? Where is it going to sell? And obviously there are lots of other designers working in a kind of similar space, but probably with different motivations, different aims, different methods, and different ways of talking about it. And I think we definitely saw in Jürgen's work some kind of interesting uh, spirit of questioning and critique going on. But we wouldn't, I mean, I would never call him a, a critical designer because uh, that was something we were using to describe our own position. The need to express themselves in a more complex way. I, I, mean, I really do see it in a younger generation where they, you know, they are dissatisfied with the world around them and they see what's around them is more complex and difficult to deal with and somehow design is a little bit too simple you know in, in, in it's not enabling them to express the world that they're living in where it's full of dilemma and I think that's kind of they like said kind of see that and want to express it. I think it. the world's open to a design mm. just so narrow you can go down the sort of designer maker very experimental often quite satisfying personal route there's the possibility to work as an industrial designer. 
But unlike architecture, for example, there's very limited options to question, reflect, challenge, speculate, dream, and all those kinds of things. And I think in our experience, we see there is a, there are a lot of younger designers who who want to, you know, do these things, and they also want to engage with the modern world in very different ways from how you're supposed to as a designer. But I think the questions that we can ask today are so more, you can't there aren't any answers anymore. It's so complex that you can't just come up with a nice solution. So I think in many ways that's another reason why it's it's becoming more interesting for younger people because it enables people to ask more broader questions about the way that we live in society and start to question the values that are in society using design. Um, I think what attracted us to it was it's sort of a, a neglected idea. Although a robot in one sense is so popular and so everywhere, from a design point of view it seems to be quite neglected. And you know, we were very interested in the fact that there are lots of um, anthropomorphic robots and zoomorphic robots and um, these kind of fantasy robots on the one hand. Then there are really beautiful industrial robots that deal with very specific functions. There have been quite a lot of artistic and experimental robots that are very technical, but the kind of cultural side of robotness seems a bit neglected. So we were interested in just seeing what happens when you, you think about a robot in a very domestic cultural context and you imagine what happens when they um, become much more integrated into our lives. And uh, robots will, I mean they're on the way, I mean there's a new, um, the Lexus car, I don't know if you know the latest Lexus, can park itself and has sent its <laughs> robot. And uh, robots don't have to look like robots, you know, they can, the robotness is in everything. So I think we just wanted to start with that project to question how our relationships to very sophisticated objects might start to evolve in different ways where it's not us as the master and them as a slave, but equally they're not equal to us, there's some other possibilities emerge. Now, I think with the project we haven't really tried to solve anything or, or make a strong conclusion, but just open some possibilities that we'd like to look at much more. But I think we also want to challenge this idea of the utopias again with robots, that robots are going to make the world a better place and they're going to solve all our problems and they're, you know, these perfect machines that are going to help us with everything. And I think it refers back to the Anxious Times project where we see people as vulnerable, as fragile, as kind of damaged people. And we think, well, obviously, if that's the persona of people and we think that our robots will reflect those kinds of values as equally. You know, they will live in a complex world and not be able to, you know, make the perfect perfect decision and be, you know, they, you know the, the relationship between people and robots I think would be a lot more complicated than just, you know, as you say, master and slave.